in the Bible today, the book of Galatians, chapter number five. We continue our journey through this wonderful short book of the Bible, but a wonderful, wonderful book. And again, I urge you to come back tonight because we're going to stay in it for the evening service as well as this morning. And I want to uh, teach you everything that I can here in the next two or three weeks about this idea of the Holy Spirit working in our lives uh, in this great chapter 5 and chapter 6 here. And so stand with me, please, Galatians chapter 5 in the Word of God, and we begin reading in verse number 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law, and Christ has become of no effect unto you, whoever you are that are, is justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. For you through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And in verse 13, for brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And verse 16, this I say unto you, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You may be seated. The first two words of verse number one today grab our attention immediately, stand fast. Stand fast. What does that mean? If someone tells you to stand fast, you know that it means to assume a fixed position, to don't move, to don't leave where you are, to stay in, the, in that position, to stand. Now, the theme of the book of Galatians, the principal thought running throughout the book is the idea of justification by faith. Justification by faith. Last week, I defined justification for you in this manner. Justification means just as if I had never sinned. Just as if I had never sinned. You see, God, being the judge in the universe, after seeing His Son go to the cross, and die for our sins and pay our penalty, God now declares you and me and all believers, He declares us to be justified. He declares us to, be, to have the charges dropped against us. The penalty has been paid. Justification. So God now looks at me as if I had never sinned. Now, he didn't say, I've never sinned. In fact, we know different than that. We all have sinned and come short of God's glory. But God looks at me through the blood of Christ. He looks at me through the cross. He looks at me as one who was guilty, but now Christ has exonerated me through his suffering, and I am just as if I had never sinned. And so Paul says to the Galatians, now stand in that. Don't move. Don't get away from that. Don't add to, take from. You stand, take a fixed position that justification is by faith and by God's grace. Now, there are several positions that people take when they view their justification, when they view their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you three of them, the three main ones today. And number one, I hope you'll take you some notes and, and uh, that you'll catch this and that you'll keep it. Number one, the first position is legalism. People who are justified or are, at least they've heard the gospel, but they think that there's more to it than just believing in Jesus Christ. I've actually had people say that to me. 
after I finished presenting the gospel to them, well, is that all there is to this thing? As if the gospel itself was inadequate and insufficient. Under legalism, they make rules or man-made requirements their Lord. They elevate that above Jesus Christ. It's not that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's that the rules, the requirements for that particular faith are the Lord. And so legalism is seeking a relationship. This is a great definition of it. If you don't clearly understand it, get this down. Legalism is seeking a relationship with God based on human works, based on doing something else that uh, in addition to the gospel, it's adding something to the gospel. It can take a lot of different forms. Legalism has a thousand faces, I promise you. You see, to the Galatians, it meant going after they were saved, still practicing circumcision as the Jewish law required, and keeping the law of Moses from the Old Testament, living under those Old Testament laws holding all the feasts, observing all the feasts that Moses had given to them, all the ceremonies, the Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, all the different things that were a part of the Jewish law, they were adding to that, they were adding to the gospel, they were adding to that in order to solidify and add something to their salvation. Now today, people are not doing that. But let me tell you what legalism is like today. I'll try to describe it so that you can't miss it. Legalism today is adding something to the gospel. It's a relationship with the Lord based upon my own efforts. And so today it comes in the form of somebody saying, well, you've got to believe in the gospel. You've got to believe in Christ, but you also have to be baptized to be saved. There are whole denominations that have added that to it. That's legalism in a modern sense. There are others who would say, well, you have to observe the Sabbath day. And they add that part of the law of Moses, the Sabbath keeping to justification. There are others who would say, you have to live a certain lifestyle. And this has particularly been true among Baptists. And we have some pretty legalistic Baptists. And uh, probably all Baptists tend to go that way a little bit. And we need to always be aware of what legalism is. You know, I've been in churches where they had this little list of rules. And if you kept those, they viewed you as being right with the Lord. And if you didn't, you weren't right with the Lord. And it was basically, basically, don't smoke, don't drink, don't cuss, don't chew, don't go to the show with girls that do. (laughs) And if you kept the rules, you were in the club. You were accepted, but boy, if you did one of those, now, you could beat your wife. Nobody was saying much about that. You know, how sad we get it all out of perspective, don't we? And so legalism is adding anything. In conservative circles, like us, legalism is often defined as some sort of negative goodness. It's what you don't do. I'm a pretty good Christian because I'm not out there carrying on like some of the other people in Florence that call themselves Christians. I'm not out there at the bar. I'm not, I'm not the party animal. And so I don't drink and I don't do those things. I don't cavort. I'm faithful to my wife. I must be a pretty good person. So it's negative goodness. It's defined on based what we don't do. In liberal churches, it tends to be positive. So legalism becomes rituals. Make sure that baby is baptized real quickly because if they're not baptized and anything were to happen, oh, they wouldn't make it to heaven. And so that's an addition to the gospel of Christ. It's ceremonies. And there are some people that go religiously to certain ceremonies. And there are others that keep the sacraments In some churches, their whole plan of salvation is sacramental. You have to do certain things, and you earn God's grace that way. And Paul says, now stand fast. 
Don't move from your position. Don't jump into legalism because if you will look there in verse number one, the apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit who wrote this called it a yoke of bondage. A yoke of bondage. What is a yoke? Well, we don't use the term. We don't, we're not very familiar with yokes anymore. We know about tractors. But a yoke was when they had two oxen who plowed together or two um, donkeys, two animals. And they carved this big wooden device, and it held them together. They put it around their necks. And boy, a yoke was a cruel thing. It was not only heavy for them, and, but it controlled them. It restrained their freedom. How would you like to be one of those boys up there? I mean, you're tied to somebody else and tied to something else, and you have no freedom of movement, and no, you're restrained in everything you do, and you can't do anything without the other person's cooperation. It'd be an awful, awful thing. It's almost cruel when you think about it, isn't it? And Paul says that when you move away when you cease to stand in the liberty that Christ has given to us, you've put yourself, you've put your own head in a yoke. That's why I said that in legalism, rules are the Lord. Rules are the king. Rules rule in a legalistic situation. And consequently, you lose your freedom. You are restrained. The Christian life squeezes you down, and it's not enjoyable. The first thing would be you would lose your joy. You would lose the thrill uh, of being a child of the Lord. And legalism does something else. Now, observe this. We have people who come here, uh, sweet Christian people, but they've come out of very legalistic uh, churches, sometimes Baptist churches. And they come here, and all their life, all the preaching they've heard is about don't, 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 don't. These are the requirements. And they're yoked. And you know what? They're very restrained. They can't, they can't enjoy the Lord. They can't enjoy their salvation. They're, they're under a the yoke of bondage, under an expectation. And you know what I've noticed about them? Now, listen, see if this, I hope this isn't you. Do you know how they, how they respond they never know when they've done enough. If you've got to add something to the gospel, then how much do you need to add? And you go through your life with this insecurity about your salvation. I've watched them. They almost never have assurance of salvation. They, they don't have the joy of the Lord. They're in a yoke of bondage. Now, go down to chapter 5 and verse 2 and notice what he says. We've already read it, but Paul said, I say unto you that if you are circumcised, Christ doesn't profit you anything. For I testify, if you get under the law, if ever, to every man that's circumcised, you're a debtor then to do the whole law. You put your head in the yoke of legalism. You put your head in the yoke of law. You got to do it all. You can't, you can't pick and choose. But if you're in Christ, you have liberty. You have freedom. I deserve a hearty amen for that statement. Amen, church, Christians? Are you enjoying your salvation? Do you really have the joy of the Lord? Do you understand that everything's been done necessary to put you into heaven? It's all done. It's finished. Legalism, where rules are the king. And Paul's conclusion, you can't mix law and grace. Don't try to do it. They're mutually ex uh, uh, exclusive. In verse 4, there's another thing I want to call your attention to. The end of, you're fallen from grace. And I've had people come and, and talk to me through the years, want to argue with me about, well, the Bible says you can fall from grace. And they mean by that you can lose your salvation if you understand the context in several weeks of Galatians now, you understand he's not talking about losing your salvation. He's talking that you were living under grace. These Judaizers came in, preached legalism to you, and you have fallen from this high position of freedom and liberty down to a place now where you're in a yoke of bondage. So you haven't lost your salvation. You have lost your joy and your liberty. And so you're fallen from the 
high position of grace that the Lord Jesus Christ purchased for you. And in verses 4 there and so on, basically he's saying, you have, in fact, the gospels profited you nothing. And uh, you put yourself in a horrible legalistic position. That's the first position. But there's a second one, and it's the whole opposite end of the spectrum. Now we go from legalism over here, where we've lost all of our freedom, to another position, and we call it license. Now the Bible doesn't use that word. It doesn't use legalism either, but the, the, the thing is license. What do we mean by license? Well, we go down to chapter 5 and verse 13. Now, brethren, you've been called to liberty, but don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, uh, one law that we have, by love, serve one another. And under license, I am the king. I am the Lord. I determine what is right and wrong. I do what I want to do. What's the emphasis there? It's I, isn't it? Under legalism, I'm restrained and bound by regulation. Under license, Man, I'm just popping my cork. I'm just doing what I want to do. I'm just, I'm just out there enjoying life. License means this. Here's your definition. I use my liberty as a license to sin, and I abuse the freedom that Jesus Christ has given me. Now, the Galatians weren't doing that. Much of the, what is written about this is written to the Corinthian church. Because the Corinthians, boy, they were, they were abusing the freedom that they had in the Lord Jesus. And I won't go there right now. Now, what is the biblical position then? We've talked a lot about legalism. Now, license. And, and the biblical position is this. I'm not under bondage to the law, but neither can I live according to the dictates of my flesh. I'm not under the law. I'm not a legalist. But the other far out position is license. I, since I am saved, since I didn't deserve anything anyhow, since I'm under grace, then I'm just going to go and do what I want to do. I'm going to live any way I want. And so you have people who, who that's their creed. That's the way they live, and they call themselves Christians. And I'm going to tell you, Florence is full of it, because you go and witness to people, and everybody's a Christian, quote, sometimes when you're out trying to talk to people about the Lord. But boy, you couldn't tell it. I mean, they are living to please their flesh. What do we mean when we say the flesh? I don't mean this stuff right here. I don't, this is not the flesh the Bible's talking about, this skin and bones and stuff in my body. The flesh in the Bible is my fallen nature. It's my human nature. It's what I was born with, the way I came into the world. I came into the world, everything was flesh. It not only is my body, it's the whole fallen part of me, my intellect, my emotions, my power to choose. It's everything that I am outside of Christ. That's a different way to say it. The flesh is everything that I am except the Holy Spirit of God who lives within me. Everything else is flesh. And so the desires to do uh, of the world and of the flesh and of the devil, they just sort of come together and people abuse their freedom that Christ purchased for them. And so many Christians I've met, and they rationalize, well, if I didn't deserve uh, salvation anyhow, if God just poured His grace out, and His grace is just infinite grace, then I can do anything I want, and I'll just confess it to the Lord and go on and live my life, right? Wrong, 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 triple wrong. No, you can't do that. And so I want you to turn with me to see that in the Bible. And we'll have to leave Galatians and go back to Romans chapter 6, if you will. Romans chapter 6, it's a parallel text to this. And in Romans 6 and 1, Paul says, what should we say then? 
Shall we continue in sin? In other words, can we just sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and know we're sinning? Can we continue in sin that God's grace may abound and just keep coming to us over and over and over and over? No. No, a thousand times no, he says. In fact, he uses the term in verse 2, God forbid. And that's as if he were to cup his hands and shout, no, you can't continue in sin, thinking that you're just going to get more grace to cover that. You're blind. You're, you're fooling yourself, Christian. We have a big word we use for that, and I don't like to use too many big words, but sometimes you need them. And the word is an antinomian. Anti, of course, means against. Nomos in the Greek language was a law, law, against the law. And so some Christians reacted against the law, and they said, boy, I don't want to be a legalist. I'm going over here. The free grace of God will under grace. I can do anything I want, right? No, you can't be against law. We're not antinomians any more than we're legalists. And so Paul says to them, don't use your liberty in Christ don't, or don't use your freedom to abuse the liberty that you have in Christ. In fact, he says here in verse, chapter 5, verse 19, let's just read a couple of verses. Go back to Galatians with me. And he tells you what the works of the flesh are. The works of the flesh are manifest, and they're adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, Anybody feel uncomfortable now? Idolatry, witchcraft, the occult, hatred, watch out. That can affect the best Christian. Variances, emulations, that's jealousy, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelings, the party animal. And such like, he, even there's more. I tell you that in time past, as I've told you now, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Hear me, professing Christian, if you're an antinomian, if you're living a life of license, look at verse 21, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Words can't be clearer, can they? So we are against legalism, but we're also against license. The Bible speaks powerfully from both. Liberty in Christ is freedom from sin. Listen to me, it's not freedom to sin. Boy, that is a, it's a good statement. Write it down. Remember it. Don't forget it. The freedom that we have in Christ is not the freedom to sin, it's the freedom from sin. And you say, well, Brother Bill, how in the world do I get there? That's the third position, it's liberty. And so we go to chapter 5, and we go to verse 13. Brethren, you've been called to liberty. That's our calling. And in liberty, Christ is the Lord. So you understand now these three positions that's so easy to fall into a couple of them and get off the path? Stand fast. Don't go into legalism. Legalism is where the rules are the king. Rules are Lord. Requirements are Lord. Don't go into license, antinomianism. If we do that, then I am the king. I do what I want. I set my own standards. But where do I go? I go to liberty, the third position, liberty, where Christ is the king. He's the Lord. So when we read the word liberty here, it's referring to the freedom that we have in Christ. Okay, now here's the question. Free from what? Liberty from what? If I can't do anything I want and I'm not under any laws and regulations, then what am I to do? 
What are you talking about? You say liberty, freedom, freedom we have in Christ? Well, free from what, preacher? Well, how many times through the years I've preached on the, uh, the three tenses of salvation? And you, you probably already know them. I hope you do. I hope you remember them. First of all, in the past tense, we can say, if we're Christians, I was saved. There was a time I was not saved. I trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I was saved. In fact, many of you can write it down. You got a date and a time in your Bible. I was on the fourth row, and they sung the sixth verse of Just, just As I Am, and I got saved right then. You know the date and time. I wish I could do that. I can't do it like that, but I know I was. And what I mean by that is because I trusted Christ, I was saved from the penalty of sin. I'm not going to go to hell for my sins. Jesus bore my sins. I'm justified. God looks at me just as if I had never sinned. Past tense, I was saved. Then the second part of it, though, is present tense. I am being saved. I am being saved. And that's sanctification. That's being made like Christ, being made holy. But what do you mean, I am being saved? Saved from what? I'm being saved from sin. Specifically, I'm being saved from the power of sin. The power of sin. Hold your finger there in Galatians and go with me back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Let me show you something Jesus said. Now, what I'm getting ready to share with you to me is the absolute secret of living a Christian life. There's nothing more important I've ever said to you as a church about living for Christ than I'm getting ready to say. So get it, get it, get it. If you're a serious Christian, Get it. You've got to comprehend this. How is it that I can live in liberty and freedom, not fall off on legalism and get all immersed in the requirements of the law? How is it then that I can restrain my flesh and not be controlled by it and live an ungodly lifestyle? How is it I can do that? Okay, I've got to understand two or three things. And first of all, I understand what Jesus said in John chapter 8. And down in verse 34, he answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Committeth, he's not meaning one time. It's a continuous tense verb. A person who practices sin. It's not talking about you falling into temptation and one sin, but you don't stay there. This is talking about sin continuous, a habit, a pattern of sin. Whoever has a pattern of sin is the servant of sin. The word servant is doulos, which means a slave. In the Bible, the doulos was the slave. If I am continually living in sin, listen to me, Christian. If I am, have a pattern of sin in my life, Jesus said, you're a slave. And the slave master is sin. You're controlled by it. And if you think that's not true, you're not thinking about yourself honestly. Because every one of us know what it is to be a slave to sin. Being saved doesn't free you from the slavery of sin. Being saved takes away the penalty of your sin, death and hell. But sanctification, which is two-thirds of the New Testament, is about being saved from the power of sin. That sin no more have a dominion over you. Turn back over to the right to the book of Romans again, to chapter 6, one more time. And I want you to read it with me, Romans 6 and 14. Romans 6 and 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you. It shall not rule over you. Sin is not to be the king, the Lord that controls you. 
Sin shall not have dominion over. You're not in the yoke with sin. You're not under the law. You're under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid, he says. No. And verse 16, know ye not that to who you yield yourself a servant or a slave to obey, his slave you are to whom you obey, whether it's sin or whether it's righteousness. Two options. So when the Bible says that we will not have sin to be, have dominion over us, it's saying that until you're saved, you're a slave to sin. And until you're saved, you don't really have much control over that because Satan can come and he'll get you every time. As he already quoted Tim a few minutes ago, he comes to seek and to kill and to destroy. And you don't have any defense against the devil, against the world, against your own flesh if you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you. And when you get saved, he moves in. He moves in. So let me give you a real good definition here. The Christian liberty is not the freedom to do what I want to do, but it's the power within me to do what I ought to do. Christian liberty is not the freedom to go out and do anything I want to do because I'm not under the law. Christian liberty is power, and that power is the Holy Spirit. That power is not willpower. That power is not you knowing a lot about the Bible because professors in theological seminaries fall into sin every day. The power to, to do what you ought to do is the power of the Holy Spirit. If He is not controlling your life, filling you like alcohol fills a drunk. The alcohol controls the drunk. It controls his thoughts, controls his behavior, controls his mouth. And the Bible says, don't be drunk like the unsaved man where the alcohol controls him. You be drunk on the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, so that your mind, your emotions, your will, your words are all under His control. And if you'll be filled with the Spirit, you will have the power to say, no, Mr. Devil, no world, no flesh. The Holy Spirit will rise up within you, and He'll give you that power that only He can give you. That's the biblical position. Listen to me. Hear me now. A sinner is not free. He is a slave of sin. He has zero power. If you're unsaved, you have zero power to free yourself from sin. But when we receive Christ, get it. This is the heart of it all. When we receive Christ, sin is still present in me, but its power is broken, broken by not me and my willpower, but broken by the Holy Spirit. I'm free from sin's domination, its control in my life. That's Christian freedom. The people who say Christian liberty gives me the freedom to do wrong, to go out and do anything I want, they don't understand Christian liberty. As a Christian, you have the power to not sin. The power is within me to never sin again. The problem is I won't always use that power. I don't know anybody. Nobody can reach perfection. But I have the power. I shouldn't be dominated by it. I may slip up occasionally, but I'm not, it's not going to be the pattern of my life. I hope I've made that clear. Boy, I wanted to make it clear. I prayed a lot that God would help me with the last part of this message. Before salvation, you didn't have the power to not sin. 
Now you do. Don't you long for that in your life? Don't you long for that in your life? Boy, I long for that in my life. That's my prayer, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the power to control sin in my life and live pleasing to you. I'll finish it up tonight. Stand to your feet with me if you will.